everyone welcome back to my channel it's been a while since I've done just a casual sit down video so I thought that today we would just sit and chat about some books as per usual I have my hot drink of choice so feel free to put me on pause and go get yourself a refreshment or a snack this video was heavily inspired by Jean over at Jean's bookish thoughts she did a video of her top 10 historical fiction novels and as a lot of you probably know I love reading historical fiction it's one of my favorite genres and I was kind of shocked that I hadn't filmed this video before so I thought I would go ahead and share with you my current top 10 historical fiction favorite novels wow I did not say that correctly I also just want to say that this list isn't exhaustive. This was largely based on what I could remember reading and really really liking and what I currently have on my shelves. I did get rid of a few books recently um, so I wanted to show what I have and what I remembered loving. Some of these are definitely some of my favorites of all time. There's some that I have read multiple times or I read a few years ago and have still stayed with me and I think I also have a few unpopular opinions. So without further ado, let's get into the books. So I am just going to say these are in no particular order, but the first book I'm going to mention is Pachinko by Min Jin Lee. I read this book two and a half years ago for the first time and oh it has stayed with me this is not only one of my favorite historical fiction books but probably one of my favorite books of all time the book starts in korea in the year 1911 and follows three generations it is a family saga and it follows this family as a young girl is married off to a man in the early 1900s and is then transported to japan and she has a daughter and then she has a daughter. This is probably one of the most beautifully fully realized books I've ever read. Not only is the writing sublime but the imagery is really beautiful and the topics that are handled in this book are done so well. There's a lot of discussion about identity and otherness and alienation especially when you're from a different country. The different kinds of abuse that the characters suffer for being Korean in Japan is heartbreaking and you can see how systemic it is to be othered even within two countries that I think from our Western point of view seem quite similar. This was deep and heartbreaking and beautiful and hopeful and challenging and sad and tense. And I think I read it in like record time. I remember taking this on a very long plane ride with me. So that tells you just how long ago this was. It was pre-COVID and I got through most of it on the plane ride and then I think I finished it the next day on holiday. So yeah, I, I love this book. I don't think I'll ever stop singing its praises and it's something that I really look forward to rereading. One of my next favorites is Margaret Atwood's Alias Grace. I love this cover as well. I love these covers of like the the kind of highly illustrated with the real photos. I love these and they are published by Virago. Of course they are. Alias Grace is based off of a true event that happened in Canada many, many years ago. And it takes place in the 1840s following Grace, our protagonist, who is accused of killing her master and his wife after she gets a job as a housekeeper. The book is just so brilliantly done. I mean, it feels real. The characters feel so human. You're left wondering throughout the whole novel whether Grace did it or not because she won't say. There's a, a very odd, quite tense, almost like seductive in a way relationship between Grace and this psychologist and of course at the time psychology is very new so it kind of explores that as well. Margaret Atwood is very well known for handling topics of femininity and womanhood and how that's been looked upon throughout history and how that can be demonized a lot of the time and she does so in such a spectacular way albeit in a situation that lends itself to that where Grace as the character and also as the real woman who existed in the 1840s was looked upon as this 
kind of evil mad woman. I love this book. I also really loved the Netflix adaptation of it as well so I would recommend both of them if you love historical fiction. I think this is a pillar of the genre. I'm also going to mention a middle grade series that does not get enough attention on booktube as far as I can see anyway and that is the Aggie Morton Mystery Queen series. So this is book one but there are currently three books out? Yeah. There are currently three books. This is written by Martha Jocelyn and follows Agatha Christie when she was a child. Heavily inspired by Agatha Christie's stories that she wrote, this follows Aggie as she's young and she encounters real life murders with her best friend, with her best friend Hector Pierrot which is always a nice little touch. You get to know Aggie's family. Of course, this is fully fictionalized, but it is based off of Agatha's real childhood and largely takes place in Cornwall and Devon and Torquay, where she grew up, which is great. And the atmosphere is so good. These are such enjoyable books and it makes me really sad that more people don't talk about them and don't give them the attention. I definitely think they deserve. If you're an Agatha Christie fan or if you just love middle grade or historical, historical fiction, this is definitely one to check out. The next book I'm going to quickly mention, I don't actually have a physical copy because all my copies are still in Canada, um, so I'll put up a picture right here, but it's Outlander by Diana Gabaldon. This might be unpopular, but I love Outlander. I read it really quickly. It was one of the series that got me really back into reading and was actually one of the series that I started booktube on back way back on my first channel. Uh, my first kind of purely booktube channel. I was reading Outlander um, just before the show started and it was getting really popular again because of all of the promotion that was going on around it and a lot of people on booktube were reading it and so yeah it kind of started my my own channel as well but the book series is just a classic to me i'll never get tired of it like it will never get old for me i also wanted to mention this because i just found out through like amazon or maybe an email from waterstones or something that diana gavadon is coming out with a new outlander book the next one the ninth one that we've all been waiting for is coming out next month so I wanted to put this in here because I'm really excited for the ninth book and I had no idea it was coming. It feels like maybe it's because I'm still largely at home and I'm not kind of like out and about as much as I was a few years ago before COVID, but it feels like there's not been a whole lot of promotion around this ninth book, which is surprising because we've been waiting a long time. Droughtlander has been very real for the books. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that, but it's just, it's one of the best. For those who may not know, Outlander follows Claire, who at the beginning of the first book, and I'm only going to briefly go over that because I don't want to give away any spoilers, but at the beginning of the first book is in 1940s Scotland on her honeymoon, and she has an encounter with these magical standing, so standing stones that takes her back in time to the... 18th century, I want to say, 1700s. It's a romance book. There's a little bit of time travel, so there's kind of like a bit of sci-fi and fantasy. <laughs> it's historical fiction. It's pure escapism and enjoyment for me. And like I said, I just don't think I'll ever tire of it. It'll never get old for me. So yeah, Outlander's definitely on the list. I am so sorry if you're distracted by the noise in the background. My dog is having like zoomies because I'm not paying attention to her. And uh, yeah, she's going nuts with her toys. So I apologize. My next favorite is quite a popular one. Um, so I won't go on too much about it, but it's The Nightingale by Kristen Hanna. I love this book. It is one of the few books that has made me cry. I remember reading this while I was visiting my parents in Canada and I had really bad jet lag and I was sitting in our dining room in a chair reading this at like four in the morning, just sobbing when I got to the end. This is definitely one that has stayed with me. Obviously World War II historical fiction is really popular. Some would say there's a surplus of World War II historical fiction out there, but for whatever reason, this is one of the ones that just really 
got me, really, really got me. Whenever I think about this book, my heartstrings are just completely pulled. I, yeah, I can't get over it and it's one that I will definitely be rereading. And as someone who does enjoy World War II historical fiction, this for me is one of the top choices. If you're gonna pick up a World War II historical fiction, I think this has to be the first one you pick up. The next one is a door stopper, and that is Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel. Now, I am still working through this series. I'm on to book two now. I don't take them too quickly. I've been advised not to read them too quickly, although sometimes I just want to sit and race through them. This has got to be one of the most interesting abnormal reading experiences I've ever had with a book. Hilary Mantel is genuinely a master at her craft. I mean, there's a reason there's been years in between the three books in this series because she not only does the, the most extensive research. This is one of the only books where I have felt like I've been put in the room with Thomas Cromwell and Henry VIII. The atmosphere is fantastic. The dialogue is really well done, although sometimes a little bit confusing. <laughs> you do have to focus. I'll say that as much as I like to rush through these books, they do take a fair amount of focus. Yeah, I can't wait. I, like I said, I'm working through the second book at the moment and um, just trying to take it slow. My impatient heart wants to just run ahead with them. Speaking of door stoppers, <laughs> actually, I thought Wolf Hall was big, but um, the next one is also kind of a fantasy crossover with historical fiction, although I would still primarily put it in the historical fiction camp, and that is Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell by Susanna Clarke or Mr. Norrell. I'm not 100% sure how you pronounce that. I think both are technically correct. I read this ages ago. I read this before I moved to Scotland. And I think it's, uh, da, 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 da. yeah, it's about a thousand, it's just over a thousand pages. And I read this in two weeks, um, which for me is really fast. <laughs> for a thousand page book, that's really fast. Definitely a book that I couldn't put down. This follows two men, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, who are kind of antithesis of each other. Mr. Norrell is kind of a small and bookish, not very attractive man, whereas Jonathan Strange is debonair, handsome, charming, and they're both magicians, and they end up kind of competing with each other. There's magical elements within this story. Like I said, it is historical fiction. It takes place in the 1800s, I believe in England, although don't quote me, it might not even be that specific. And it's it's a really immersive read, not only because it's huge, but it's one of those that has like, yeah, there's one, it has like foot, what am I, footnotes, I was gonna say foot pages, it's got footnotes in it, um, so it takes focus, but it's it's really fun. There's even illustrate. I forgot there were illustrations in this. Gosh, yeah, look at that. Oh, that's fun too. If you haven't tried it before, it is a commitment, but it's so good. I haven't watched the adaptation, but I haven't heard great things about it, so it's not really top on my list, especially because I do love the book so, so, so much. Okay, I'm gonna come in with another possibly unpopular opinion, but I need you to hear me out. One of my favorite, I'm just gonna say this is one of my favorite authors, and I'm gonna hold up the first book in the series as I'm reading it, because you could read it a couple different ways. And yeah, I just want you to hear me out. So I really like Philippa Gregory. <laughs> lots of people have lots of problems with Philippa Gregory. And to an extent, I understand. They think she takes too many liberties, um, which she probably does. And, <laughs> you know, everything's really, romanticized and a lot of things that happen in her books didn't happen in real life. I get that, but for me I feel like if I wanted it if I wanted a historical text, I would read nonfiction. I pick this up knowing it's fiction, knowing that this isn't an accurate kind of adaptation of what really happened and that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a story to just take me away. 
I like the romanticizing of it. So yeah, I love Philippa Gregory. Like I said, there are two ways to read hist her historical novels. You can read them in the order that they were published, or you could do what I'm doing and read them according to the chronological order of the historical events. So if you're going to do that, The Lady of the Rivers is the first one because it starts out in 1430. And that'll be the first one. For me, this makes the most sense because then you're following the line of succession. <laughs> and as someone who didn't receive any kind of education on British monarchy or history, it just helps me make sense of things. So Philippa Gregory is on my list and I will stick by that. I used to, I also used to read her books when I was a teenager. I didn't make it through all of them, um, but I made it through some of them and I'm now rereading them so that I can read all of them. And it, they're fun. They're really fun. Like I said, I know they're fiction. If I wanted history, and sometimes I do, I would read a nonfiction book. But this is fiction and I think it's fun. And on the total opposite end of that, this is a much more serious book um, and much more affecting. The next one is How Much of These Hills is Gold by C. Pam Zhang. I think that's how you pronounce this. This was long listed for the 2020 Man Booker. Not that that means anything. Um, I picked it up because I really loved the synopsis. I'm going to put this in historical fiction. But I will say it's not specified when this takes place. I believe it is the late uh, 1800s. But as I will show you, it says XX62. So it doesn't say what century it takes place in. To be honest, it doesn't really matter. But I think it's the late 1800s based on the fact that it takes place during the kind of American West, American Dream, Manifest Destiny, Moving West. Um, migration that happened. This is beautiful. I feel like I'm not going to do this justice, but I will do my best. This is about two girls who have lost their parents and their sisters. <laughs> should probably point that out. And they end up trying to go west just like their father wanted them to. They are on the run. They believe that they keep seeing these creatures that their father um, believed in or certainly gave them the impression that existed in the West like tigers and because they were witness to their father's death they are essentially doing this to give him some kind of proper burial. However in the journey to do this the girls have very different ideas of what that means and it ends up kind of separating them and they end up growing apart and they go separate ways and it follows them on their separate lives and it's just, oh, I'm not doing it. I knew I wouldn't do this justice. It's so good. There's a huge element of this about, once again, like Pachinko, identity, otherness, alienation. It's made fairly clear that the family these two girls are from are not white. I don't know if it's ever said specifically, but the impression I got was that they are Asian American because of that they're under suspicion a lot of the time. People don't look at them the way they would if they were two small white kids. When their parents die, it's often treated as some kind of omen or almost like it was deserved because they weren't white. And stereotypes and misconceptions are what they are even today. So this was beautiful and heartbreaking. I had a difficult time putting this down for sure. If you like historical, I mean, I just want everybody to read this anyway, but if you like historical fiction, you haven't read How Much of These Hills is Gold, you absolutely should. It's fabulous. It's so, so good. And uh, another, what I would think is going to be pillar of the genre. And the last book I want to talk about, I'm very excited because I ordered a new copy since I got rid of my first copy and I was just so upset about it and I don't know why I did that. But that is The Clockmaker's Daughter by Kate Morton. I don't think this is one of her more popular books, but to be honest, this is the only book of hers I have so far gotten all the way through and I was hooked. This actually half takes place in present day and half takes place in the past. In the historical fiction part of the novel, the year is 1862. It's the summer and there are a group of young artists that meet at this 
kind of beautiful manner. But then one of the group is shot dead, and so there's this mystery that needs to be uncovered. In the present day part of the novel, a woman who works in an archival job finds a leather satchel with two seemingly unrelated things inside. There's a picture of a woman in Victorian clothing and a sketchbook, and this kind of entices her to the mystery of this manor, it leaves her all over the place, and you go back and forth in time, which is fairly common for Kate Morton. I loved this. It's a big book, but I loved it. I couldn't put it down. I also um, geeked out a little bit because the manor and the artist group are molded after the house that William Morris lived in, and his kind of group of friends and himself, and I'm a huge William Morris fan, as you probably know, so I was so excited to see that be a part of the story. I believe there's also an interview with Kate Morton on YouTube somewhere just before this book came out where she talks about the inspiration in William Morris and the manor, um, Kelmsicott Manor, I want to say? Is, uh, is, I mean, it's called, it's not called that in the book, but I believe the actual house is called Kelmsicott. I'll put it on the screen if I'm wrong. It's just, it's very, it's fascinating to me. So that definitely helped, but I loved this book. I think it's great. It's so much fun and very, very quick, regardless of its length. And those are all the books I wanted to share with you. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I know, like I said, I haven't done a sit down video in a while. I've been really feeling the vlog, but I did want to do a sit down video. I would love to know what some of your favorite historical fiction books are. I'm a big, big reader of it, so if I can get any recommendations of books that I haven't read yet, I would love that. Please let me know, and I will see you guys in my next video. Slanjava!